welcome to Heartland for Children's Let's Talk About It podcast, where we provide education and resources for family matters in Polk, Highlands, and Hardy counties. June is National Reunification Month, and in this special episode, we're excited to have Heartland for Children's CEO, Kim Doherty, host a discussion with three members of our Parent Advisory Council. These mothers candidly share their experiences of what led to the removal of their children and what helped them get to the place of being successfully reunified with their kids. We're so glad that you joined us. So now, let's talk about it. Well, hello, my name is Kim Doherty. I'm the Chief Executive Officer with Heartland for Children. We are the lead community-based care agency serving Polk, Hardy, and Highlands counties here in Florida. I'm so excited to be here today with three members of our Parent Advisory Committee. Um, that actively meets monthly to talk about how we can improve our our child welfare system here locally, serving the parents that um, are receiving services from our child welfare system. So I, I wanna first introduce, I've got Allie here with me. And so Allie, um, how long have you been reunified with your children? Um, six and a half years. Wonderful. And you've been a very active member with our PAC committee and we're so thankful for that. And how about you, Brooke? Hi, um, I've been reunified for a little over three years now. Great, thank you. All right, and we've got Reba. Reba, how are you? I'm good. Um, I've been reunified for my kids for about two and a half years. Okay, so we're going to ask some questions here tonight on the podcast that we're, we're going to talk through. So, um, and, and I'm going to direct these to you. Um, so I'd like to start with Allie. What would you say was the biggest challenge you faced during the reunification process? The biggest challenge for me was the time management. Um, They get being given so much stuff to complete during my reunification process and not having enough hours in a day. You know, um, when you get reunified, they expect you to have a job and do this and do that. And attending outpatient treatment for six hours out of the day and then still having to work a full-time job and make it to drug tests and a lot of communication. There was a lot of communication issues when it came to the reunification process the first time. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where uh, I struggled a lot because the ball would be dropped and I felt like my back was up against the wall or that I really had no allies on my side. And when you're going through that with your first child, you know, Mm -hmm. it it sucks and it Mm -hmm. hurts a lot because you don't really know what you're supposed to do. And by the third child, I became pretty much a pro at this reunification process. So I felt like with each time it got a little bit easier, mm-hmm. but each time the biggest challenge was always completing everything they wanted done on this time frame, and still trying to keep my cool and communicate effectively. So doing all those steps and the amount of time that's given, that's really a great point. And so what would you say, Reba, um, in terms of the biggest challenge that you were working while you were working towards reunification and the recovery work that you were doing? The biggest challenge I faced during my my reunification process was um, like understanding the terminology. Um, if you've never been in the system, terminology is very hard. Um, it's not something you hear every day on like, you know, the regular streets. You know, people don't walk around saying permanency staffing, you know, people don't walk around <laughs> saying, you know, dependency, you know, that's just not what people do. And all so, the acronyms we use, right? Yeah, so like they're very confusing. So, you know, like my caseworker, for instance, kept telling me, you know, oh, permanency staffing, permanency staffing. Okay, well, permanency is permanent, which means long term, you know, and then staffing is sounds to me like a job you know so I keep telling her I'm like you know I have a job like I don't know why you keep telling me permanent staffing like and she's like eventually she was like no like you need to be there it's for your children and I was like well if you would have said that to begin with (laughs) we wouldn't be arguing back and forth and I wouldn't be missing things so I feel like um communication like Allie said really is key because if you're sitting there with a parent who's never done this and you're just throwing these words at them they're gonna be like I have no clue what you're saying. They're going to be overwhelmed. They're going to be overstimulated. They might even lash out. You know, not all parents know how to handle being overstimulated. You know, it's just part of, um, you know, being in either addiction or domestic abuse. You know, for me, it was addiction and a domestic abuse. 
um, was, was what my case plan consisted of. So for me, it was, I was trying to figure out how to be a mom, get clean, stay out of a domestic violence relationship because I did leave him. So, you know, that first step was taken before I got into DCF, but you know, still, you know, I still had to recover from that. I still had to get off of drugs. I still had to figure out how to be a sober single mom, which is big from being just a sober mom with a partner to being a sober mom, taking care of kids by yourself, supporting daily, financially, emotionally, mentally, all of those things. It is one of the hardest things to be able to do. So for a lot of moms, you know, being overstimulated is really hard. So break it down, talk to them, make it easy. Those are great points. And, I, you know, both you and Allie mentioned about the, just the, the importance of communication, the importance of understanding the terminology as caseworkers are working with families, you know, and the resiliency to stay the course and to stay the course that many times when it's so hard with the expectations and demands that are there and that the system does put on families. So we recognize that very much. So, Brooke... Could you tell us a little bit about, with your journey, how did you stay motivated when you were separated from your your child? Um, So I was actually really blessed with a great support system, not only from my family, um, but like friends that I had made in the treatment center because I also went to, um, what's it called, resident? Residential treatment. Residential treatment. Um, So the couple of people that I had in there, my counselor in there, and then my kid's father's family. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and also just the, the willpower in me, like it was either I could stay in treatment, do better, you know, get my life right. Like I wanted to, or I could leave treatment and go back to nothing. So it was like, I know, I knew that I wanted to get clean. I knew that I wanted, you know, my children back. So I think just having that support system around me in my weakest time, like when I wanted to just leave because, you know, there was people telling me what to do and I wasn't used to that. Like, you got to wake up at this time. Live with 10 plus other girls who are also trying to get clean. It's not very easy. So having them to lean on in that weak moment, I think, helped a lot, like, keep me going to where whenever I got to a point where I was like, even though you're clean and you're sober off of drugs, it still takes your mind a while to actually get clean, like to think soberly, like think sober thoughts. Um, so just having that support system is really, really important. Yes, thank you for sharing that piece. And, and now that you're able to look about, look back at that and say those, having those um, support um, moments, right, that you were able to talk through and have them right there with you. Right. All right. So, um, Allie, talk with us about... What changes have you made in your life to ensure that the reunification, and you mentioned that your reunification was around six and a half years ago, but what changes have you made to ensure a successful reunification with your children? Well, I stopped using drugs. That's the first part. Um, I had uh, a lot of trauma that I had never dealt with and a lot of um, anger and stuff like that. And I had as part of my case plan, you know, to see a therapist. And let me tell you, therapists, don't ever do that. (laughs) Um, No, I'm kidding. But um, I kept getting pushed around and pushed around. It was like they didn't want to deal with my problems, Mm -hmm. even though that's their job. I I had multiple quit on me. It's like you you literally had the most traumatic childhood. I can't deal with your issues. You're going to have to go see somebody else. Mm -hmm. And, like, I had to go through this complete breakdown and uh like to my core of everything that I've been through and had to like kind of work it out either with myself um and I did a did a lot of writing and once I started like stripping away everything that I wasn't Mm -hmm. you know I, I wasn't I'm not a drug addict um I'm not a bad person you know all this stuff that was like instilled in me since I was young all the way up to now even in my adult years you know I still deal with a mother who tells me all this stuff but I had to like strip away all of that to get to myself because I I didn't know who I was I didn't I didn't know what I liked I didn't even know what my favorite color was 
it's like I kept putting on mask after mask and chameleon, chameleonizing myself mm-hmm. with my surroundings. And once I like got back to where I knew or I could start to see the person that I used to be, it made like things go a lot smoother mm-hmm. because then I could be a mom. You know, I could be a wife and a friend and I kept putting others before what was important to me and I had to stop doing that and I had to quit letting these people get in my head and tell me like you're never you're not going to be able to do this and believe it or not your surroundings and the people that you put yourself around can be detrimental to like your mental health and your just well-being when you're going through something like this because there are so many times that I wanted to give up but I knew that I couldn't and I wasn't allowed to like I tell myself you're not allowed to quit and I think with JJ and his mom being by my side as well as like select people it made sure that I was I was doing the right thing to keep going and making it a little bit easier each time. Yeah, you articulated that so beautifully. And I think that ties right into this theme of Reunification Month is to believe in resiliency and the strength of families and the resiliency in the short time that I've known each of you, you, you are just tremendously resilient and, and you have stayed the course and, and you have a deep desire through our Parent Advisory Council to um, to want to bring others in to share your stories and to share your experiences so that you can help others so if there's other parents out there moms and dads that might be separated from their children right now because they're working um, on a case plan or um, have um, you know they're really working on recovery right now for themselves so that they can um, go and be the parent that they they know they want to be and can pr- provide safety for their children um you know i want to have us have you speak to that um how has now that you have your children back and giving that hope to those parents that might be out there how has your relationship changed with your children when they came back and they were reunified with you did you see a shift in the change of the relationship and how um, how about that reba you want to take um, that for me um, my children were kind of young, mm-hmm. um, so like I always had a really good bond with my daughters um, from birth. Like my kids were never separated from me, so I got to have those bonding times with my children. So my kids were very bonded to me. So it was very hard for them to understand, you know, why for nine months, you know, I wasn't allowed to, you know, I had to go to treatment, and I had to stay there, and I had to live there, and I had to do all these things. So. Um, you know, it was it was very hard for them to begin with. So when I got home, you know, it was a lot of ensuring my kids, like, you know, that's not going to happen again. Don't worry about that. You know, like when I would leave for work, my youngest, she would get like really upset because in her eyes, you know, mommy was leaving and didn't know how long mommy would be gone because, you know, before when mommy would leave, it, mommy wouldn't be able to come back till like, you know, whenever. So it was a lot of like, you know, reassuring and stuff. But now my kids when I walk out of the door they know that I'll be right back they know those things um my daughter's seven years old and she's like unfortunately way more mature than I want her to be (laughs) and you know like as she gets older I'm very honest with my children um I instill an honesty with my kids and the only way I can expect honesty from them is if I give it to them so there's nothing about my past that I hide from my kids and you know some people are like you know well they're young yeah well they're young but that doesn't make a difference you know let them know young then maybe as they get older they're not going to follow in mine and their father's footsteps you know because unfortunately for my kids both me and their father had a history of addiction you know so unfortunately it was all around my children Mm -hmm. so you know honesty for me is huge you know I don't lie to my kids about anything they ask me a question like my daughter she you know she knows her dad is in jail and she looked at me and she said mommy have you ever been to jail Absolutely, and it sucks, don't ever do it. Like, you know, (laughs) like, there's things that you just need to reassure your kids about. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's the biggest changes that I made with my kids. Because before I used to sugarcoat it, you know, don't worry, mommy's okay. Now it's, no, listen, this is what happened, this is what you want to know, this is what you don't do in the future. You know, you want to know about something, come and ask me. 
open line of communication, honesty, and just lots of, like, you know, reassurance. You know, I do positive affirmations with my kids. Um, that's something I did in treatment to help me. You know, that's something that they instilled in us. You know, we had to do them every day. And I feel it's very important as girls, because I have all daughters. So for me, it's very important that my daughters have good self-esteem, you know, that they don't need anybody to validate them, you know, because that was my problem. That's why I got into a domestic violence relationship. I didn't see the signs, and I was just glad that somebody was like, you know, all about me. But it wasn't the right attention. And I want my kids to understand that, you know, there's a difference. So for me, honesty, communication, you know, just like lines of everything if they ask a question answer it honestly even if you don't want your kid to look at you some type of way I don't care look at me some type of way learn from what I did and do better you know don't be like me do better than me it's kind of like what I instill in my kids because I can't change my past but I can make sure that they have a better future yes that relationship piece and being able to be honest and transparent and for them to feel safe to come and ask you those questions that's beautiful and and that really shows that you um um, and that they know you're coming back, right? Yeah, so that that's very important for my youngest. She was mm-hmm. terrified for the longest time. So, yeah. like, it took me a long time to instill that in her. Yeah, so that's mm-hmm. wonderful. That just shows the health in that relationship that continues to grow. So, as the, um, as you were working on your reunification, and um, maybe even currently right now, um, I, I would like for each of you, and we'll start here with Allie, if each of you would go around and share what resources in the community were helpful t- for you. Um, as you were working through your reunification, um, and if there was someone uh, listening to the podcast, um, what resources would you recommend? I know all three of you have shared that your recovery and the support through your recovery and um, different relationships through um, your case management organizations, some were help, um, more strong, were stronger than others, right? But if you can speak and just share maybe one or two resources that you would want others to know about, then I'll start with you, Allie. Um. There wasn't a whole lot of resources that I was able to use, but I think the biggest one for me was Tri County. Mm-hmm. Um, coming from my drug addiction, and you know, uh, I was with Devereaux, I was with DCF, and I was tossed around a lot. Tri County was consistent, and Miss mm-hmm. Nelda Jackson is like an amazing woman. She was my counselor when I was in Razoo. And she's taken over Tri County with a, a vengeance, and she's one of us. Mm-hmm. You know, she she was a struggling addict, and watching her get on top and do what she's done is it gives me hope for myself to be able to work with others. And they were always, if I needed something when I was pregnant, they they were there. You know, if um if I couldn't make it to my drug test, but they, you know, they were like, hey, we have bus passes. I've even had Miss Nelda come all the way to Mulberry to pick me up to pee in a cup, you know? <laughs> so they were like my biggest resource and ally to have. That's great. How about you, Brian? Um, One of the resources that really helped me was, again, Tri-County. I am a firm believer that my treatment saved my life. Um, one thing that really helped me was my counselor, Um, At first, I kind of bucked her because, you know, I've buried all that crap down there. I don't want to bring it up, you know, hashing out old feelings. But once I broke that barrier and was able to start working through everything, me and my counselor had a really great relationship. um, And it helped me solve a lot of unresolved things inside of me that I never knew were a problem. And it just, like I said, it saved my life. I'm a firm believer in that. Um, and don't ever give up. I thought about giving up multiple times, especially whenever you're in treatment, living with all those women. Um, you just want to leave because you're like, you know what? I don't have to be here. Don't give up because there is light at the end of the tunnel. Therapy is not always fun, but you know, it really does work, you know, for a lot of people, some people they're different, but for me, therapy, working through a bunch of things because I had domestic violence history, my addiction, um, depression that I didn't even know I had Mm -hmm. that resulted in my addiction. Mm -hmm. You know, I was able to learn how to navigate all of those feelings and the big emotions in my therapy that I still use today. Mm -hmm. And I've been out of treatment for almost four years. So yeah, I would say therapy and a counselor. Okay. So really talking that and, and 
and all of you have been so open to sharing and, and showing the work that you've done um, through understanding your, your trauma, right? And right. understanding and working through that. What would you say? Um, well, again, Tri County. Um, I think I think for <laughs> any I think win. for anybody in addiction, Tri County is probably the best place to be. Just because, you know, for me, like like with them, I went to residential, um, you know, and long term residential does suck. Like oh. Brooke said, it does. You know, being in another house <laughs> with a bunch of women for nine months does not sound like the ideal thing to do with your life. But you know, it's better than the alternative. Right. So, you know, Tri-County, big supporter. Um, the rooms, uh, you know, before I went to treatment, I had no idea what recovery looked like. So I went to a meeting before I went to treatment, just so I kind of had an idea of, like, what it was, what it looked like, the people that were going to be there, you know. Um, and when I went for the first time, you know, I told them that I was going to treatment or whatever, and everybody was great about it. So, you know, I, I suggest that because somebody can find – a support system there if you don't have the family or you don't have the people around you to support you you know there's plenty of people in the rooms that would be willing to do so um it's like a family outside of a family it's a great resource um and it's not something that helped me but it is something we have now um we made a website and um it's like the abc's of dcf and it basically tells you like you know um things that you need to know it um gives you like a dictionary list of words that you might not understand like me and it's helpful um so that's not something I was able to use but it is something that you can use now right and that resource that, I'm so glad you brought that up so on the Heartland for Children website um which is heartlandforchildren.org um for the listeners that are out there there is a parent section right and so parent you portal. put the parent portal and so there's really great resources out there that you all have identified I know that um workers that are out there social workers that are working with families have shared with us that we've been able to put up there so anyone can go there it's out there on our public website um, for more information and a lot of the acronyms are, are out there so that you can try to understand what this is the language that many times the social workers speak um you know you all talked about recovery and a consistent um provider out there with stri county that you said really helped make a difference you shared um, the relationships of support with extended family. Um, all of those things are so important to help you be here where you are today. Um, you know, when you look at your children today and they're home with you, and I've watched you parent, whether that's on a virtual screen or have children be here at Heartland with us as we've met, they are beautiful <laughs> and uh, handsome, and you can just see that you glow when you're with your children. And so what are your hopes for your children? Um, and, you know, you work so hard to get them back and to keep them safe, right? Um, and, and so I just was I'm curious of your thoughts about your hopes for your children. Um, like Reva said, um, since being reunified with my kids, and I do have a daughter that is older, um, she unfortunately had to go through a lot of my bad times with me and, you know, just all that fun stuff. I am big on being honest with them. Um, I have normalized apologizing to my children because I still have bad days. I still struggle with my own demons. Um, I know better now how to deal with them, but we're not perfect. Mm -hmm. um, so now I just like to instill, like, if you're having a bad day, just let me know. I will give you your space. Um, like she said, if my daughter ever asks anything, like, you know, kids have sticky fingers sometimes. I'm able to have that sit down conversation with her like, hey, mommy did this before and I went to jail for it. And I promise you, it is not fun. OK, so just having that open line of communication with your children, it doesn't matter how old they are. If you're one of those people that are like, oh, they're too young to know that. You can fit it to what they will register. So you may not want to give them all the details, but just tell them, like, my daughter doesn't know that I was in rehab for drugs, but she knows that mommy went to the doctors because I was sick and I had to stay there until I was better. So it's like you can be honest with your kids in a child-friendly way, I guess you could say. Um, so I just hope that, you know, because I didn't really have that growing up. It was, you know, back in the older days where they stick you outside and you come back when the streetlights are on. Um, now... <laughs> I still try to do that. Sometimes I'm like, y'all go play outside. But I never had, like I was sheltered from a lot of different things. Like I never knew about all of this stuff until I was like in it. 
And then it's like, I didn't know enough to get back out either. So it's like being able to tell my children what I've gone through and how I got through it and what I did to help myself. Like, I think it's good for them to know that we struggle sometimes. I think it's good for them to know that we struggle just because we're their parents. We are not perfect. Um, So that hopefully when my children get older, they can see what I have done and learn from it. That's, that's my hopes. And that's, you know, all I can do is be honest with them and show them the way that I, you know, went through the mud and then came back out on the other side. All right. So what would you say would be, if you wanted to tell, and we'll go over here, Ruba, to you, what would you want to tell other families that are in the process of reunification? Um, be patient. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, for me, it took mm-hmm. forever for the judge to sign off my reunification, mm-hmm. like literally forever. It took two weeks. So, you know, I was very anxious the entire time. Um, You know, not everything happens when you want it to happen. Um, Yes, you know, not everything might be be done the correct way, which is a lot of times a lot of the problem. Mm -hmm. You know, parents are like, well, you know, this isn't getting done and that's not getting Mm -hmm. done. Um, So if that's the case, then aggravation. Mm -hmm. Aggravate them until they do Mm -hmm. it. Um, That was my biggest thing. That's what I had to do. Um, So, you know, just patience and stay consistent and you know, just stay persistent, you know, like consistency, persistency, and patience. Those are going to get you everywhere because being impatient is what I meant to say. I'm sorry. And, um, you know, just trying to fight back is not going to get you anywhere. So patience is, patience is a virtue here. <laughs> yes. All right. Well, I want to thank you all for being here for this uh, podcast and for sharing your, your journey uh, with recovery as well as re, um, talking through the steps that you took for having your children come back from a reunification perspective. Um, June is reunification month, and we are very glad that we're going to be able to share the podcast with others that may be out there who have reunified with their children and or are working towards reunification. So if there's anyone who wants some more information about uh, reunification month, visit our website at heartlandforchildren.org. Okay. Thank you for listening to Heartland for Children's Let's Talk About It podcast. There is a great need for foster families who are willing to open their hearts and homes to teens, sibling groups, and children with special needs. To learn more, check out the description for resources or visit heartlandforchildren.org.